Darby's Translation 1890 The Acts 4 And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being distressed on account of their teaching the people and preaching by Jesus the resurrection from among the dead, and they laid hands on them, and put them in ward till the morrow, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men had become about five thousand. And it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together at Jerusalem, and Annas the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the high priestly family, and having placed them in the midst they inquired, In what power or in what name have ye done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are called upon to answer as to the good deed done to the infirm man, how he has been healed, be it known to you all, and to all the people of Israel, that in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom ye have crucified, whom God has raised from among the dead, by him this man stands here, before you sound in body. He is the stone which has been set at not by you the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And salvation is in none other, for neither is there another name under heaven, heaven which is given among men by which we must be saved. But seeing the boldness of Peter and John, and perceiving that they were unlettered and uninstructed men, they wondered, and they recognized them that they were with Jesus. And beholding the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to reply. But having commanded them to go out of the council, they conferred with one another, saying, What shall we do to these men? For that indeed an evident sign has come to pass through their means is manifest to all that inhabit Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But that it be not further spread among the people, let us threaten them severely no longer to speak to any man in this name. And having called them, they charged them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answering said to them, If it be righteous before God to listen to you rather than to God, judge ye, for as for us we cannot refrain from speaking of the things which we have seen and heard. But they, having further threatened them, let them go, finding no way how they might punish them, on account of the people, because all glorified God for what had taken place, for the man on whom this sign of healing had taken place was above forty years old. And having been let go, they came to their own company, and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And they, having heard it, lifted up their voice with one accord to God, and said, Lord, thou art the God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and all that is in them, who hast said by the mouth of thy servant David, Why have the nations raged haughtily and the peoples meditated vain things? The kings of the earth were there, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For in truth against thy holy servant Jesus, whom thou hadst anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the nations and peoples of Israel, have been gathered together in this city to do whatever thy hand and thy counsel had determined before should come to pass. And now, Lord, look upon their threatenings, and give to thy bondmen with all boldness to speak thy word, in that thou stretchest out thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders take place through the name of thy holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were assembled shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and spoke the word of God with boldness. And the heart and soul of the multitude of those that had believed were one, and not one said that anything of what he possessed was his own, but all things were common to them, and with great power did the apostles give witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. For neither was there anyone in want among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses, selling them, brought the price of what was sold and laid it at the feet of the apostles, and distribution was made to each according as any one might have need. And Joseph, who had been surnamed Barnabas by the apostles, which is, being interpreted, son of consolation, a Levite, Cyprian by birth, being possessed of land, having sold it, brought the money and laid it at the feet of the apostles. Acts 4 By F. B. Hole As we read the opening verses we find the answer to this offer which was given by the official heads of the nation. The offer being based on the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, it was particularly obnoxious to the Sadducees and to the priests, who were of that party. They gave it an unqualified rejection by arresting the apostles. The work of God, in converting power, went on however, as verse 4 records, and the next day, when examined before the council, Peter found fresh opportunity for testimony, in answering their question as to the power and name in which he had acted. The name and power was that of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom they had crucified and whom God had exalted. Psalm 118 verse 22 had been fulfilled in him, and Peter proceeded to widen out the testimony, testimony from that which was particular to that which is universal. 
The power of the name was right before their eyes in the particular case of the lame man healed, it was no less potent for the salvation of men universally. The physical healing of the man was just a sign of the spiritual healing which the name of Jesus brings. The despised Jesus of Nazareth is the only door into salvation. Verses 13-22 show most strikingly how Peter's testimony was vindicated. The apostles were unlearned and ignorant according to worldly standards, yet they had been with Jesus and were bold, and this impressed the council, who would fain have condemned them. Three things hindered however. 1. They could say nothing against it, verse 14. 2. They had to confess, we cannot deny it, verse 16. 3. They found nothing how they might punish them, verse 21. When men wish to discredit anything, they usually in the first place deny it, if that be at all possible. If that be not possible, they find some way of speaking against it, misrepresenting it, if need be. Lastly, if that be not possible, they attack the persons involved in the thing, blackening their characters and punishing them. These three well-known devices were in the minds of the council, but all failed them since they were fighting against God. They could merely threaten them and demand that they cease to proclaim the name of Jesus. Peter repudiated their demand, since God had commanded them to preach in the name of Jesus, and as he was infinitely the higher authority, they must obey him rather than them. There fo follows, verses 23-37, a beautiful picture of the early church in Jerusalem. Released by the council, the apostles went to their own company. This shows us that at the outset the church was a company distinct and apart from the world, even from the religious world of Judaism. This point needs much emphasis in days when the world and the church have so largely been mixed together. The early church found its resource in prayer. In the emergency they turned to God and not to men. They might have wished for a council less Sadducean in character with more liberality and breadth of outlook, but they did not agitate to get it, they simply sought the face of God, the sovereign ruler of men. In their prayer they were led to the word of God. Psalm 2 shed its light on the situation that confronted them. The interpretation of it would refer it to the last days, but they saw the application of it which referred to their days. The early church was marked by subjection to the word, finding in it all the light and guidance they needed. This also was a very important and instructive feature. They were marked too by far more concern for the honor of the name of Jesus than for their own ease and comfort. They did not request a cessation of persecution and opposition, but that they might have boldness in speaking the word, and that miraculous support which would exalt his name. The church is the place where that name is held dear. As a result of this there was an exceptional manifestation of the power of the Spirit. All of them were filled with him, the very building where they met was shaken, and their prayer for a special boldness was instantly answered. And not only this, that which they had not requested was granted to them, they all were of one heart and of one soul. This of course flowed out of the fact that the one Spirit was filling every one of them. If all believers today were filled with the Spirit oneness of mind and heart would mark them. It is the only way in which such oneness can be brought to pass. Out of this flowed the next feature which verse 33 mentions. There was great power in the apostles' testimony to the world. The church did not preach, but filled with grace and power it supported those who did. The preaching then, as always, lay in the hands of those called of God to do it, but the power with which they did it was largely influenced by the state that characterized the whole church. The closing verses show that just as there was powerful testimony flowing without so there was the circulation of love and care within. The Christian communism, mentioned at the end of chapter 2, still continued. The distribution was made to each, according as he had need. Not people's wants, but their needs were met, and so nobody lacked. At a later date Paul could say, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, Philippians 4 verse 12, but at this time such experiences were unknown by the saints in Jerusalem. Whether, by escaping such experiences, they profited more than Paul did, by having them, may be an open question, though we incline to think they did not. At any rate, the action of Barnabas was very beautiful and the love and care found in the church then should be known today, though there may be some variation in the exact mode of expressing it.